Shabbat Shalom to the Mitzvah to the family of Yah. Welcome to Daughter of Yah Teaching Ministry. Going to go ahead and bring my sis in. Shabbat Shalom, sis. Shabbat Shalom. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing wonderful. Cannot complain. Just glad to be in the presence of Yah once again. We apologize for um, getting the message out a little bit later today. So you guys are getting like a late afternoon, early evening Shabbat message. But nonetheless, you know, this is, you know, his set apart day. So uh, we're just grateful to have you here with us. How was your week, sis? It was wonderful. Um, I can't complain. Again, I, I, you know, I'm just blessed to um, be here on the Shabbat. I always look forward to the Shabbat. <laughs> right. Do you have any just, good news that you wanted to share? Done with my class. Your grand, you didn't and my grandson came. <laughs> I, I don't know, was he here last week? Last yeah, week? but we we haven't, I mean, it wasn't since the last teaching. So this oh, will be okay. new to okay. everyone. I didn't know if I shared it on the last Sabbath or not. No. Yes, uh, my um grandson is um was born uh on the 29th of June, and so um, praise be to y'all. All is well. All praises be to y'all. Yeah, that was autumn you shared the last time. Oh, so yes, yes. yes. <laughs> so we have a brand you know, new... I have a, a lot of grandchildren, so my please <laughs> forgive me. Yes, uh, Mr. Ace was here on the 29th of um <laughs> right down um June. So yes, praise be to y'all. I was yes, I was so... able to be there for his birth. Yes, yeah, so welcome another sheep into the fold. So we're going to go ahead and get right into today's message. Um, as you saw the title, uh, guys, I was not really planning on doing a message this Shabbat. Um, but when I was on my walk, I think it was yesterday. Yes, on um, yes, yesterday, Friday morning, I was going on my walk with Yah. And I had the opportunity, um, I've shared this previously before, um, about this beautiful garden where I go walk in, and there's this one lady who has beautiful landscaping, beautiful garden, and um, she had a garden sign there, and I had shared with her, as I'm going to share with you, um, if you watched our last teaching, uh, the last, that teaching, specific teaching, I can't remember what the name was, but um, one of, on one of our previous teachings, um, I shared with her what garden actually means um, in Hebrew, and she was really surprised, but I was able to uh, kind of share a little bit um, of the word with her and what it means, and I talked about the beginning, Adam and Eve in the garden, and when I left there, I kind of felt like um, something was going to come from our meeting. Um, we spoke for about a good half an hour and she was sharing with me, you know, some of the plants and different things of that sort. Just really just, you know, talking about gardening and things of that sort. And I was sharing with her how I did not have a green thumb, but with my plant, Joseph, Yah is continuing to add and continuing to increase. And um, I didn't put the video up this time but uh next time I will show you since the last time I thought Joseph was done growing and he is y'all has increased him even more okay he is I thought it was four new buds now it's five plus there are three new branches that are growing two from the stalk and one from the actual potty so this plant is just like Joseph is just like how Yasharel was that's why Pharaoh wanted to get rid of them because he said, look, these, these Israelites, they're, they're growing too fast. They popping our babies left and right. They're outnumbering us. And so I just repotting him and y'all brought him back from death to life. And now it looks like again in the fall, I'm going to have to get a new pot because he's growing out. And Yas is just continuing to do things. So having said that, all of that has culminated the uh the message that is going to come before you today. And so I was asked and I was, this was presented to me via the Ruach. It was dropped in my heart about life in the Garden of Eden before sin. What was life like in the Garden of Eden before sin? 
because we're talking about the Garden of Yah and a return to Eden. And so before I go into this message, I want to ask you that question or even have you to just say lot or ponder or think on it. What was life like? What, what do you, based off of the things that we've read in the scripture and how the father Abiyah is leading us and what he has done to make sure that we return to Eden, what do you assume or ponder or believe that life in the Garden of Eden was like before sin occurred? Now, I'm going to share with you some things that the Ruach has shared with me and the new perspective that I have about the Garden of Eden and the tender loving care in detail that Yah takes when it comes to planting his and his vineyards and compare it to his people. And so before sin in the Garden, Adam and Eve, um, they lived a, a life of innocence. They had never known sin. They didn't know um, what sin was. Um, there was no guilt or shame because they had a pure heart. They had clean hands. Uh, they had a perfect relationship with the Father Yah as he walked with them. The scripture tells us that he walked um, I believe that's Genesis 3 and 8, if I'm not mistaken, but he walked with them. And so this tells us that they regularly met and communed with the Father Yah um, because of their sinless nature. They were able to enjoy direct fellowship with him. And so this is based off of what we see was occurring pre and post sin that occurred in the garden. And so I wanted to share with you, the Ruach wanted me to look up Eden. And when I look this up in Eden, as it is mentioned in context in Genesis 2 and 3, Eden means pleasure. It means pleasure, the first habitat of man after the creation. Okay. The first habitat. And when you look here at the bottom, it says Eden, the region of Adam's home. So this was the home of Adam, okay? This was the home of Adam. And so when we, when we think about Eden and we think about the garden and the planting and the planner, I'm going to present some things to you today that maybe you had not thought of before. So let's talk about covenant. Okay, when we, when we speak about covenant, I want you to think about the first covenant, the covenant of marriage, that first covenant as it was outlined in Genesis 2 and 24, where it says that a man shall leave his father and his mother and he shall cling to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And this oneness that Adam and Eve, the man and the woman, would share is a oneness that will be dedicated to Yah. They will be one in doing his will. So when we talk about the first assignment, that the man and the woman, Adam and Eve had, their first assignment that they had as husband and wife um, was to tend to the garden. That was the first assignment that man had, was to tend to the garden. And Eve was his helper. We, If you did not go back and watch the teaching that we did, I believe it was last month, on the helper, go back. Go back and watch that on Eve the Helper. I tell you, your soul will be blessed if you are a man and you're confused about the role of a woman. When you're done with that, you will have a whole newfound respect for women in ministry, um, women, um, your wife, your daughter, your sister, your mother, and the role that they play. But 
Man's first assignment was to tend to the garden. That was Adam and Eve's, the man and the woman's first assignment together, dedicated to Yah to do his will. And he planted them in a garden. He planted Adam and Eve in a garden and he placed them there. And their assignment was to tend to the garden. That was their job. That was their assignment, their work. But it was a joyous work and it wasn't arduous and cumbersome like the work that we have when we get up in the morning and the alarm clock goes off, you're like, oh, you know, you don't want to get up and go. That was not um, the experience that Adam and Eve had um, prior or pre-sin that occurred in the garden. But their job, their first assignment was to tend to the garden, but only for six days. And then they rested like their Abaya on the seventh day, okay? And during this week, um, the rock took me back to when I first cried out to the Father, Yah, because it says that we don't know not, we know not what to pray, that what we ought to pray for, that the, the Ruach, the spirit, um, makes utterance for us on interceding on our behalf. And I remember when I was reading, and this was just when the Father Yah was getting ready to pull me out of the church. And I remember reading um Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, where he you know, they said, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We, we did all these many wonderful works. And then he still tells them, depart from me. I never knew you. And I thought, how horrible would it be to get to the end, to think that I'm saved only to hear, I never knew you, depart from me. You who work at the iniquity, you who are lawless, okay? And I said, well, how will I know if I'm, if I'm, if I'm learning doctrine that's taught by the commandments of men. And, and I began to, and at that moment, I began to weep and to cry. And I was on my knees crying out to the father, asking for, for the father God to um, reveal himself. I remember clearly saying, reveal yourself. I'm like snotting on the floor, on my knees, crying out to the father. And I said, I want to know who you are reveal yourself to me. As soon as I said, reveal yourself to me immediately, I heard it in my ear as, as you hear the sound of my voice, I heard you must keep my Sabbath. That's what I heard. You must keep my Sabbath. This week, the Abba took me back to what he told me and he reminded me and he wanted me to say that the covenant begins with the Sabbath because the Sabbath is the rest. Yasharel did not enter into his rest. The majority of them out of Joshua and Caleb and those that were under age of 20 did not enter into his rest because of their disobedience and they hated his provision. And he kept, I kept hearing this all throughout the week that the covenant begins with the Sabbath. When I asked him, when I said, I want to know who you are, he didn't give me a bunch of rules. He said, you must keep my Sabbath. That was my first assignment from the father, because I was heavily active in the church, very loving church that with the truth that they knew we were actually, I was actually going out witnessing on the Sabbath because we had church on Sunday. We were actually going out witnessing door to door, preaching the good news on the Sabbath. I was part of the outreach ministry. I was there for Bible study before church, Wednesday night Bible study there for regular service. I was very active and I had a love, a genuine love for the father. And the Abaya knew that, but they could only take me so far. So he had to pull me out. And after, and his first assignment to me was to keep his Sabbath. So that sent me on. I'm like thinking, well, I thought I am. I'm looking at a calendar where Monday is at first. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm thinking Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I'm thinking Sunday, seven. He's like, no, go look at your calendar. It's Sunday. Is the first day of the week. That's the first day of the week. And the seventh day is, which we know is Saturday. That is the, the Sabbath, the seventh day. And that's the reason why no one can take me away from that because the Ruach himself, that was my first time actually hearing the voice of him speaking to me. Um, Because I remember the boy Samuel, when we read, he it says that he he didn't know that Yah had been calling him when Yah was calling him, he didn't know because it said that he didn't know yet the voice of Yah. So I that's when I first knew the voice of Yah. 
And that's how he communicates me with me oftentimes, not saying right here audibly, or when I did my three-day fast, I did. Um, but I'm saying just on a regular, because I'm in commune with him and I'm in the secret place with him, he always, the rock always sends me to a scripture and, or I'll hear something or I'll be led to something. And that's how he deals with me. And so my first assignment was to keep the Sabbath. And the Sabbath was in the beginning before um, Adam and Eve was even placed in the garden. They It was already there, okay? And so, and I don't have any idea why I'm going off speaking about the Sabbath. So I'm being led of the Ruach. Maybe there's someone that needs to hear this. But the first assignment of Adam and Eve was to tend to the garden. So the point that I'm making, and I, I want to uh, get into some precepts because we need to understand uh, the will of the father and how Adam and Eve changed things for all of us because they stepped outside of the will of the father. Okay. And so I want to read a couple of uh, precepts before we get into this message. So I'm reading John 1 verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the word and the word was with Yah and the word was Yah. He was with Yah in the beginning. Through him, all things were made and without him, nothing was made that had been made. So we, we know that Yahushua is the word of Yah. He is the Aleph and the Tav. He is the beginning and the end. He is the living word of Yah. He is a word of Yah that is spoken. The word that came in the flesh and dwelt among us as we get ready to go now to John 1 verses 10. In verse 14, he was in the world and through the world was made through him. The world did not recognize him. So the world didn't recognize him. He is the word of Yah, but they didn't recognize him. And the word became flesh. See, Yah's word, when his spoken word, once his word is spoken, it's, the scripture tells us that his word performs, his word runs swiftly to perform all that he has spoken. The word became flesh. Yahushua became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, a glory as of only of, of an only begotten son from the father. So he is the only begotten. Don't let anyone trick you out of your salvation and tell you that Joseph is the father, an earthly fleshly man. He is the only begotten son of the father, Yah, full of grace and truth. So when we read Genesis 1, verses 3, verse 6, verse 9 through 11, 14 to 20, it says, Yah said, and Yah said, let there be light, and it was so. And Yah said, let the firmness of it, with everything, when he said it, it ended with it was so. Everything that he spoke, Yahushua was right there in the beginning because he has said, whatever I hear my father say, he said, I can do nothing on my own. Whatever I hear my father say, that is what I do. So Yahushua is the living word. He is the word of Yah. He is the voice of Yah. Revelations 19 and 13. This is in the end when he comes back for war. It says that he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. He's not coming back as a sweet little lamb when he comes back. He is coming back to judge. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of Yah. Yahushua is the word of Yah. John 5 and 30, it says, I can do nothing by myself. Yahushua said it himself. I can do nothing by myself. He said, I judge only as I hear and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will but the will of him who sent me. So he is clarifying. He said, on my own, I can do nothing. He said, I judge only as I hear, as I hear. That's how I judge. When the father spoke the word, he began to perform it and to do his will. 
and to create everything that he heard the father speaking. They are one in likeness and purpose. It doesn't mean that Yah is Yahusha and Yahusha is Yah. They are one in likeness and in purpose, just as in a marriage covenant or covenant marriage, a husband and wife, they are one, but the husband is not the wife. The wife is not the husband, but they are one in likeness in all things, submitting themselves, dedicated to the will of Yah. Okay. John 6 and 38, for I have come down from heaven, but not to do my own will, Yahushua said. He said, but I came to do the will of him who sent me. So the point that I want to make is that, because we're going to go into, into the, the, uh, the word garden. The point that I want to make is Yahushua does nothing, nothing as we have read outside of the will and the father. Even Adam and Eve, before they were placed in that garden, when they were placed in that garden, they were given rulership over the animals and over the garden and the birds and all of that. But they were not given ownership. Let me repeat this again. Adam and Eve were given rulership over the animals, the birds, the creep, and all of those things, and the garden but they were not given ownership. They were placed in that garden to rule over and to guard and to protect. We, his people, when he gives you something, we are to be good stewards over the things that he blesses us with. We own nothing. On our own, we can do nothing. We cannot wake ourselves up in the morning. We can't, um, everything you have, no matter how many degrees you think you have, how educated you think you are, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding comes from him. People can pervert what he has given you. People can misuse and abuse what he has given to you, but let's make it perfectly clear. We're nothing but vapor, okay? Dust. We can, apart from him, we can't even crack our eyelids open, okay? And man has gotten haughty to think in their heart that they are a God, that they can speak something into existence, that they are in control. Yah has given man rulership over the earth, not ownership. We don't own this. And when he gets ready to come down on his throne to visit us, to show us who's in control, you know it. Because when he shut everything down three years ago in 2020, he says, then you will know that I am Yah. He doesn't have to exert his power because his power, his glory is everywhere. He knows who, he's, he, who he is. We don't know who he is. And so again, let's go into garden. Garden, according to the ancient Hebrew lexicon of the Bible, is, is Gamil Nun. Gamil is the foot. The, and that, that's the walk. The seed is Nun, the generation. It means protection. For those of you who did not know, and I shared with that woman when I was on the wall, that garden, I said, do you know that in the Hebrew, that garden means protection? She said, really? I said, yes. She said, I had no idea that garden means protection. And I began to talk about Adam and Eve and how when they stepped outside of the father's will and stepped up, they stepped outside of his protection and how they were no longer covered because the father Yah showed me that they were covered with the righteousness of Yah. So they didn't need clothes on because they was covered with his righteousness. But the father Yah told me when they sinned, that's when they became uncovered and knew they were naked. Okay. And so she was, she was really floored. She said, but she said, you know what? That makes sense. And we spent a oh, half an hour talking about this. Garden, according to the ancient Hebrew lexicon of the Bible, means protection. The pictograph Gamil is a picture of a foot and it means to walk with an extended mean to gather. The nun is a picture of a sprouting seed. Combine these mean a gathering of seeds. Now I want you to think about that. A gathering of seeds. I'm going to expound on this in a moment. 
I'm going to share with you what the rock revealed to me and what he allowed me to put together. A garden is a place for growing crops and is often surrounded by a rock wall or hedge to protect it from grazing animals. A garden enclosed by walls for protection, a shield as a wall of protection. So Adam and Eve were placed in Eden, which was a place of pleasure, okay? And this place was enclosed. It was fenced by a wall of protection. So we know that Yah is our shield. He is our defense. He is our refuge. He is our high and strong tower that we can run into in the time of trouble. But it is a shield as a wall of protection. So when we think about this, um, we, we talk about the 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 protection that Adam and Eve had in this garden, this shield, this covering. Now, a garden, this is a place for growing crops. And when you most gardens, um if and I I I want to begin, even though I said I don't have a green thumb, I, I feel like yeah it is giving me the desire to start growing things. Now, especially now more than ever, growing my own food, but growing a garden. But most gardens are surrounded by a, a, a rock wall or a hedge or something to protect it from grazing animals, to protect it from the animals. So when we think about this slippery serpent, okay, that was in this garden, um, I want to talk about plant to uh to plant so a plant is the pictograph none and it is a picture of a sea and it represents the sons of the next generation so plant means innocence plant means innocent a plant let me say it again plant means innocent okay adam and eve were planted in the garden and they were innocent the the kuf is a picture of the sun at the horizon and the drawing in of light combined these mean child drawn in a child that is drawn in that is gathered in it says the bringing in and holding close of an infant to the breast. Innocent, where the infant suckles. Innocent, a state of innocent as a child. Yahushua said, unless ye be like a little child, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven because most children are innocent. And they're like sponges taking in everything that they hear from their parents. That's the reason why you have to be careful of the environment that you raise your children in and training them up in the way of Yah. That's why he says, if you prevent even the least one of these children from coming unto me, it'd be better if you had a millstone hung around your neck and you were thrown in the midst of the sea and drowned in the sea. It would be better for that to happen to you to find, than to find out what would happen to you if you prevent your child from entering into the kingdom. So y'all cares about how we treat, treat children and, and his children because children are a gift from y'all. They are, they are, we have been given rulership over them, but not ownership. You got that? They belong to him, but we have been given rulership over them. Okay, so it matters what is being planted in their ears. Okay, so plant means innocent. And it also means a sapling. That is a sucking branch. So you think about Yahushua said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Okay, and we get our water from him. He is the living water. He says, he who drinks from me will never thirst. He told the Samaritan, I have what I have. You drink of me, you never thirst. He quenches your, your thirst forever. 
And so we think about eating means pleasure. Garden means protection. Plant means innocent. And then the father, yeah, was like, planter. Look up planter. Planter. Someone who planters, someone who plants is a planter. Yah is the planter. He, it means to fasten. To fasten. According to the ancient Hebrew lexicon of the Bible, planter means to fasten. Fasten is the Hebrew letter wa or the va, the sixth letter, which means to make secure. It means to join together, to add to, to adhere to, to attach yourself to, to nail, which is the wa, and to connect. Now, eating was a place <clears throat> of pleasure, not lust, a place of joy, a place of peace, a place where we had a perfect relationship with the father, a place where we were covered and shielded because eating means a place of pleasure. Garden means protection, a place where we were protected. Plant, we just learned, means innocent. In the garden, Adam and Eve not only had pleasures and joy, because he says at his right hand are pleasures and joy forevermore. But they're, they were also protected. They were shielded. But plant, because they were plants. And he oftentimes refers to people in the scripture as trees, as plants. The fig tree, bearing no fruit, all of those things. But plant. It means Adam and Eve were innocent. They were in a continual state of innocent, guiltless, with no shame. They were plants, meaning they were in a continual state of innocent. And they were fastened because they were planted by the planter who is Yah. They planter means fastened. They were fastened. They were joined and securely attached, joined to like the rope, joined to like a husband and wife when they become one. That's why divorce there it is a violent dismembering. We, they were one. We were one with him. Yasharel, we were one with him. When we fastened ourselves, that's why you show always said, take heed, lest you be deceived. Take heed. Fasten means to be joined and securely attached to. Adam and Eve were fastened to Yah. They were securely attached to Yah. They had pleasures and joy forevermore. They were under his protection and in a continual state of innocent. Innocence because they were plants. Hallelujah. So again, they were the 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 what the father Yah and the Ruach have been just just these things that I've been just hearing this week is the Hebrew concept of a garden. And I want to, and I want, let me go back. Garden means, the whole concept of a garden means to surround, it means to defend, it means to protect. It's an enclosed area that's walled, that's, that's walled, that's shield, that protects whatever is behind it or, or enclosed within it. And so when we talk about the biblical garden, it is very much symbolic of salvation. And that's what I was hearing this week. 
the, the concept of a garden, the biblical and the spiritual concept of a garden is salvation and protection because the goal for us is to return to Eden. That's the goal. We're going we're gonna to talk about that. Let's go into some scripture. We're going to go into Genesis so that you can see what I'm talking about. The concept of the garden, again, is symbolic of salvation and protection and joy. Genesis 2, verses 4 through 9. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day of the making of Yah Almighty's earth and heaven. And every shrub of the field was not yet on the earth. And every plant of the field had not yet sprung up. For Yah Almighty had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. And the mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the earth. And Yah Almighty formed the man from the dust of the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And Yah Almighty planted a garden in Eden to the east, and he put the man whom he had formed there. And out of the ground, Yah Almighty made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the middle of the garden, also the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we know that Yah did have the tree of knowledge and good and evil there. And some people ask, why was it there if he knew? Because he wants you to choose him. Just like anyone you date, or you're married to, you want someone to choose you. You don't want someone to be with you because you had to twist their arm and put a gun to their head and coerce them. You want someone who chooses you because they love you and they want to be with you. This is the same thing for our Father Yah. Genesis chapter two, verses 15 through 18. And Yah Almighty took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. So there again, we see that man was put in the Garden of Eden to do two things, to work it, meaning to tend to it, and to keep it, meaning to guard it, okay, to guard it. And Yah Almighty commanded the man saying, eating, you may eat of every tree in the garden, but, the, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you may not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And Yah Almighty said, it is not good uh, for man to be alone. He said, I will make him a suitable helper, a helper to him. So he wanted to make someone that was suitable, someone that was like him of his own kind. Genesis 3, verses 1 through 5. So, so well, let me just quickly recap. So man was placed in the garden of Eden to cultivate it, to keep it, to, and, and under his leadership, the garden was supposed to flourish. The garden was supposed to be fru uh, fruitful, just like we're supposed to bear fruit, okay? Yah didn't allow Adam to do this alone. He said, it's not good. I'm going to give him a helper, someone who can help him uh, take care of this garden. It was only after the sin that Adam ruled over her. She was there to help, okay? Um, but the only thing that she ended up doing was, as we will see, is dividing the kingdom, okay? Genesis 3, verses 1 through 5. And the serpent was cunning above every beast of the field which Yah Almighty had made. And he said to the woman, is it so that Yah has said you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, of the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. But of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, Yah has said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it unless you die. And the serpent said to the woman, which was a lie, you shall not die. For Yah knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you shall be as Yah, knowing good and evil. Unfortunately, this is the same lie that many people are eating up today, that they can be a God, that they're going to be just like Yah, okay? Knowing good and evil, this was the sin of mixing, okay? 
that mixing good and evil, mixing clean and unclean, the, profound, the, the holy and the profane, that was the sin that was committed because we were never supposed to know good and evil. We were never supposed to know good and evil. And so this was a lie, but she ate that lie. She believed that lie. And this is a lie that many are teaching and preaching, even pastors in the church, that you can go against the word of Yah and still receive salvation, still be saved, okay? Genesis chapter three, verses eight through 13. And they heard the sound of Yah Almighty walking up and down in the garden at the breeze of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the face of Yah Almighty in the middle of the trees of the garden. And Yah Almighty called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, well, I heard your sound. You know, I heard your voice in the garden. He said, and I was afraid for I am naked and I hid myself. So Yah said, well, who told you that you were naked? He said, have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, well, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave to me of the tree and then I ate. So instead of taking accountability, he's placing the blame on her. And Yah Almighty said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So Revelations 12 and 9 said that Satan has deceived the whole world. That's what's going on right now. Right now, as you hear the sound of my voice, the serpent, Satan, he has deceived the whole world. He's not, he doesn't have any new tricks. He's using the same things he used in the garden and they're working. Okay. And so the kingdom, remember, they were attached. They were, they had a perfect relation, relationship with the father. They were fastened to him. They directly communicated with him. They walk with him and fellowship with him. Um, but after the sin in the garden, uh, everything changed. And the only thing, like I said, the kingdom became divided. The division of the kingdom happened in the garden, okay? And um, the whole thing about knowing good and evil, because we see a lot of people that's caught up in new age and all kind of thing, and even in this awakening you know, they ever, you know, seeking for, for, for knowledge, but they still, still don't know the truth. But the point is all knowledge or knowing everything that doesn't lead to life. All knowledge does not lead to life. Let me say this again. All knowledge does not lead to life. Trusting in Yah's word is what leads to life. Trusting in what he has said and believing it, and walking on, and standing in it, and that's what did not happen, so because of doubt, and disbelief, and disobedience to Yah's word, we're going to find out what happened, Genesis 3, 14, and 15, and Yah Almighty said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed above all beasts, and above every animal of the field, you shall go on your belly and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Remember, I talked about this when I last uh, Shabbat, when I shared my dream of judgment, okay? When he's going to tell Babylon to sit in the dust. Sitting in the dust is judgment, okay? And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he will bruise your head and you shall bruise his head heal um so this right here is uh genesis 3 14 and 15 this is the first messianic prophecy that yahushua our master would come through the seed of the woman because in scripture normally is given through the genealogy of the male but with yahushua it comes through mary's his Miriam, his mother's lineage and so it will come through the seed of the woman through eve okay uh, but through this, we would through this uh, prophecy, this messianic prophecy, this is a promise, okay, um, a covenant promise that he will save man from their dreadful mistake, okay. Um, 
that um, Yahusha would uh, restore all things back to their original state um, before the sin was created. Um, so we know before um, Yah created the earth, the earth was a wilderness. It was a wasteland. It was uninhabitable. It was a space until Yah came in and brought light. Okay, the garden was well watered. It was resource, full of resources. As we know, there are four rivers that flow. There was gold there. Um, it in the in the garden, Yah had provided everything that it, that that man needed. Okay, there was no, we we had a, a, enough for nothing. There was nothing that we we needed. Okay, he man pr was provided everything in the garden. So, so again, this was a messianic prophecy um, of our coming Mashiach and what he would um what he would come to do because again he is a living word and the word came in the flesh and dwelt among us and so something that i want to share with you guys and what was shared and something that i had not even thought about is who he was i mean i know who he is but one of his missions that i had not considered before let's continue reading genesis 3 verses 16 through 20 and he said to the woman, I will greatly increase your sorrow and your conception. You shall bear, bear sons and sorrow and your desires shall be towards your husband and he shall rule over you. And he said to the man, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree, which I commanded you saying you shall not eat from it. He said, the ground shall be cursed because of you. You shall eat of it in sorrow all the days of your life. And it shall bring forth thorns and thistles for you. And you shall eat the plant of the field. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread until you return to the ground. For you have been taken out of it. For you are dust and to dust you shall return. And the man called the name of his wife Eve because she became the mother of all living. And so Adam, Adama, is earth. Eve is living because she is the mother of all on this earth something that the ruach brought to my attention because it says that you shall bring forth thorns and thistles and it just reminded me of yahusha okay and why they placed the crown of thorns and thistles on his head and this was symbolic of what he would do bearing the sin okay because when his death didn't nail the law of yah to the tree it nailed the law of sin and death when you read romans 8 verses 1 through 3 it tells you that yahusha nailed the law of sin and death to the tree not yah's teachings instructions not his commandments okay not the torah you have to go back and understand Romans chapter six and seven. Paul, the apostle Shaul speaks of two different laws, okay? But the law of sin and death is the law that was nailed to the tree. And so this is the reason why he had on a crown of thorns and thistles that will represent what he would have to bear because of it. And so because of this, this the first sacrifice happened in the garden oh yes y'all almighty made coats of skin where do you think that came from for the man and his wife and he clothed them so now he has to put physical clothes they have to be clothed now a sacrifice had to be made because of sin an animal had to die sacrifice think about that they, they 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 had to be clothed now because now they know that they're naked. They know that they're ashamed, they're guilty, they're exposed, they're uncovered now because they were clothed with the righteousness of Yah. And then once they stepped outside of his will, now they're uncovered. Okay, now they know that they're naked. They know that they're guilty and they're ashamed of their guilt, okay? They're uh, they're ashamed, and that's what sin does. 
That's what sh- sin does. When you do something wrong, especially if you are in Yah, you are ashamed. You are ashamed to even come to the Father. You are ashamed of your behavior. Have you ever done something and was so ashamed of your behavior? This is what sin does. Sin brings shame. Even if you, if a dog eats up the toilet tissue and then you come and you got to roll up the newspaper and you tell the dog to come here, Ruffy. Ruffy coming, but he he got his head bent down. You you got an animal, you know how they look. They give you those puppy dog eyes. Why? Because they're ashamed of their behavior and they know that they're wrong. They're not wagging their tail when you got a, a newspaper rolled up. They know what time it is. Okay, so um, let's continue. So now we're reading Genesis chapter three, verses 22 through 24. And Yah Almighty said, behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now at least he put forth his hand and also take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Yah Almighty sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground out of which he was taken. And he drove the man out and he lodged the cherubs at the east of Eden. So he drove, Yah drove the man out. Okay, he drove the man out. Yah was not going to leave mankind in this continual state (laughs) of guilt, this continual state of shame. Remember, sin contaminates you. Let me say this again. Sin contaminates you. Okay, through Adam, sin passed to all man. So that's why when we're born, we're born in sin because of Adam. That's our father, our forefather. Because of what he did, unfortunately, sin passed on to all men. That's why we have to be what? Born again, born again of the rock, of water and the rock. Because no flesh will enter into the kingdom of Yah. So man, man has, because of sin and what sin does and because it taints, because it contaminates, um, he couldn't leave us in that state. If, if man would have taken from the tree of life, they would have lived forever without ever, being able to come back to Yah. Think about that. We would have we would have been without hope. If we just, I want you to really ponder on that. Once they sin, death was our death was slowly occurring. It's just like the flowers in the attic, the poison on the cookies. The kids said they didn't die right away, but the grandmother kept sprinkling her little poison on. Eventually. That the the poison took its toll, and they eventually did die. They didn't die right away. They enjoyed the cookies, and the cookies taste good. That's what sin does. Sin deceives you and make you think that sin is good. It makes you think that sin tastes good. That's not. That's lust. The pleasure of the, of this world has mankind deceived into thinking that they're alive when they're really dead. They're decaying and defiled on the inside. They just haven't healed over yet. But it's just like the flower in the attic when she was giving them the cookies. They were eating them up. They taste good. They enjoyed them. And then as you can, as the weeks went on, they had dark circles around their eyes. They started to look sick. They began to get weak. And then eventually they died. That's what sin does to us. It kills us slowly. And eventually we will be destroyed if we don't repent of it. That's what, so y'all didn't want to leave us continually in that state and then take from the tree of life and live forever in that state. And then he would have had to just destroy us because he couldn't have us in that state. All praises be to Yah. So what did he do to protect us? 
from the dreadful from the dreadful mistake that Adam and Eve committed, making sure that they didn't totally annihilate mankind from ever having a relationship with the Father. He sent a flaming sword swirling to guard the way of the tree of life. But this was not a regular sword, a flaming sword. When I look this up, this sword, because flaming was, a, it was fire. Flaming in the ancient Hebrew, Hebrew that's the kind of the Bible is fire. Sword was lightning. It says the shining flash of a sword as it is thrust. Let me go back here, sorry. It says, as lightning, look at NM, because that's the definition. As lightning as a sword from the sky. To thrust a sword or to throw lightning bolts. Also, lightning as a sword from the skies. Lightning, you remember Adam, I mean, uh, Yasharel, when they had to stand before the, the father, when Moses told them to clean themselves? And, and and they had to get the commands and they were scared. They were terrified at the thundering and the lightning. They were like, uh-uh, no, you you go, Moses. You you go ahead and talk to him. You, you tell us what he said. Lightning to this day, when you hear that big boom, will have everybody get right. <laughs> It'll have you go sit down somewhere real quick and get away from the window and sit down and respect the father while he's doing his work. When I was a little girl, my grandmother, when Yah was when, when it was raining heavily and thundering and lightning, she would have us sit down, cut all the lights off, cut the TV off, don't have no lectures, put unplug everything, and we're gonna sit down while the father is doing his work. And we could not cut on the television and go outside and do anything until he was done. Our forefathers, they might not have, they might not have known the truth, but they had a, 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 a reverence of the father and respect that this generation just doesn't. Lightning, they, the, the, the flaming sword that was guarding the tree of life was lightning, protecting so that they would not come in that way. So he wasn't doing that to scare them. It was to give the, put the fear in them, but it was so that they would not come and enter back in and destroy themselves and possibly eat from that tree. He was saving us. You ever had someone save, like someone is saving you from yourself and you don't even know it? <laughs> That's how good our father Yah is. Even when we think that he's not, when, when we're being punished, he's, he, he's still saving us. Even when we think we're being punished, Yah is still saving us so we're we're close to finishing so now i want to talk about gethsemane and something that was brought to my attention and as i was reading the scripture is nowhere in scripture do we find the words garden of gethsemane we, we do not see or find the words Garden of Gethsemane anywhere in scripture. But I'm going to show you what the Father showed me, where this comes from and where they get this from. Okay. So Gethsemane is a Hebrew word, geth or gath, depending on how you want to spell it. And geth means press. Okay. Semini or shemen means oil. When I look this up, um, according to the uh, Blue Letter Bible, in its context, as we're going to be reading in Matthew 26, it actually means an oil press. It's the name of a place at the foot of the Mount of Olives, the Mount, I'm sorry, the Mount of Olives, beyond the Torrent Kidron. Okay, Gethsemane, it is a garden near Jerusalem, but we don't find this term, but we get where they're saying it. The Hebrew and Ruth Bible says it means, Gethsemane means olive oil press. 
Olive oil press. I want you to think about that and how we get olive oil because the olives have to be pressed. There has to be pressure in order to get the gleaming oil because we know that oil means to shine. So when he says to let your light shine, according to the ancient Hebrew lexicon of the Bible, that oil means to shine. And I want you to think about that. When we think about the, uh, the, the foolish virgins that had no oil in their lamp because the oil is symbolic of the measuring of the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh that is poured out. So Gethsemane means an oil press, an olive oil press. So Yahusha, what was revealed to me in scripture that he is the true gardener. He is the true gardener. We're going to read Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 45. Then Yahushua came with them to a place called Gethsemane. So he's with his disciples. He's going, he's getting ready. This is before they're going to arrest him to take him off to be crucified. And he is in much anguish. Okay. And this place that he's going to pray, they this is not called the Garden of Gethsemane. But it is Gethsemane, but it's an olive oil press. So when you think about that, the olive oil press, and you think about what he had to go through, the crushing, the pressing, and the crushing that he went through. He was bruised for our iniquities. Think about all the things and for our transgressions. Think about everything. He it says, Yahushua came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to, to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray. And taking along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to grieve and to be deeply troubled. See, this is that pressing. That This is that pressing because this Gethsemane means the olive oil press. So he is deeply grieved. Because he knows what's ahead, but it says it was a joy that was set before him that caused him to remain on the tree. We are his joy. He, he endured all things for us. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. It says in verse 38, then he said to them, he's speaking to his disciples. He said, my soul is deeply grieved. Not just grieved, but deeply grieved. He says, even unto death. He says, stay here and watch with me. And going for a little while, and going forward a little while, he fell on his face praying and saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. So he came to the father, Yah. He is deeply grieved. He's prostrating himself. He's praying. He says he's praying. He, he fell on his face. You on your face, your face is at the ground. You are prostrating yourself. That is worship. He, he's praying. He said, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. He said, but yet not my will, let your will as you will. And he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so he said, were you not able to watch with me? One hour, you couldn't stay awake one hour. I told you to watch me while I pray. You couldn't even watch one hour. Watch and pray that you do not enter in temptation. The spirit is indeed ready, but the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, he says, but the flesh is weak. Verse 42, again, going away a second time, he prayed saying, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to pass away, except I drink it, then let your will be done. He said, well, if, it, if this cup cannot pass away, except if this is what you have will for me to drink, he said, then let your will be done. But he came to him a second time. Now, why is he coming to him a second time? Because he has not heard from the father. The father has not answered him. And I want you to think about this as oftentimes, when you go to the father and you're praying for things and he's not answering and he's not responding and you're going through things, it might very well be because he means for you to go through this. But he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
if this is, if you're going through because it is a trial that he's taking you through, not because you're going through because of her unrighteousness and you're reaping what you sow. There's a difference. Verse 43, and coming, he again found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy and leaving them going away again. He prayed a third time saying the same word. So he is repeating the same thing three times. You know why? Because he's not hearing from him. He's not hearing from him. Verse 45, then he came to his disciples and said to them, sleep on and get rest for what times remain. He said, for whatever little time remain, because he said, my time is drawing near. The hour has drawn near that the son of man is getting ready to be betrayed into the hands of sinner. Rise up, let us go. Behold, the one betraying me draws near. Now we're going to read John. Um, chapter uh, 18 verses 1 through 2 and then we're going to read John chapter 19 verses 40 through 41 John 18 1 and 2 having said these things Yahushua went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron where there was a garden in which he and his disciples entered so this is where they get the saying the garden of Gethsemane you don't see that term garden of Gethsemane but this is, as we saw, according to the Blue Letter Bible, Gethsemane is the uh, the garden that's across from the brook Kidron. It did say that. So this is what the Father showed me in scripture where they get that. Because in John, John gives a different account. It, it doesn't say Gethsemane, but it says that he went out with his disciples across the brook from Kidron. So most of the good news, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, most of them, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, most of them are, they give the same accounts. The wording may be different, paraphrased differently, but it's the same thing. But John is the only book of those four that does not mention Gethsemane, but it actually says across the brook Kidron. And so I wanted to show you in scripture that that was Gethsemane, okay? Where there was a garden in which he and his disciples entered. So he and his disciples gathered many times um, in Gethsemane. And this is why, and this was well, not why, but this is how Judas knew where to find him, okay? Because in, in where he could find him so that he could betray him because he met with him um, along with the disciples here in uh, Gethsemane, verse two. And Judas, the one betraying him, also knew the place because Yahushua had many times assembled there with his disciples, just as I stated. Um, John chapter 19, verses 40 through 41. Then they took the body of Yahushua and bound it in linen. So this is after the death, okay? He's already been crucified, okay? Um, uh, John 19, verse 40. Then they took the body of Yahushua and bound it in linen with spices, as it is usual with the Jews, and bury it. And there was a garden in the place where he was crucified. So where he was crucified, there was a garden. And it said it was a new tomb in the garden in which no one had ever been placed there. So his body was placed, wrapped in linen with spices. And it was play, his body was placed in a garden. And it was in a tomb in a garden, in a place where no, where no one else had been. Okay. Now we're on John chapter 20. Um, Verses um, one and two. <clears throat> but on the first of the Sabbath, Miriam Magdalene came early to the tomb, darkness yet being on it, and she saw the stone having been removed from the tomb. So she came at the end of the Sabbath, okay? Once the Sabbath was over, she did not come on the first day of the week, okay? Yahushua died on a Wednesday evening and three days later, Okay, the prophecy of Jonah, just as Jonah was in the, the mouth of the fish for three days and three nights, so shall the son of man. He died on a Wednesday evening. People don't understand the feast, Pesach, and this is the reason why they get confused because they believe that the day of preparation, as it states in scripture, they're thinking, okay, they prepare for the Sabbath on Friday. So he died on Friday, he rose on Sunday, but that doesn't even give you two days at best. It was during Pesach. He died on a Wednesday evening and he rose at the end of the Sabbath. Wednesday evening, he died. Thursday evening, day one. Friday evening, day two. Saturday evening, day three. At the end, okay, of the Sabbath, 
Mary and Mary Magdalene came to anoint him with spices. When they got there, they saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciples whom Yahushua loved and, and said to them, they took away the master out of the tomb and we do not know where they lay. So they're, she's frantic because they came to see him and his body and anoint him. And they're like, okay, where is he? And Miriam stood outside at the tomb. Now she's weeping. She's weeping because she can't, she thinks that they took his body away and she doesn't know where he, where he has been laid. Then as she wept, she stooped down into the tomb and she saw two cherubs clothed in white who were sitting, one at his pillow and one at the foot of the bed where the body of Yahushua had been laid. And they said to her, woman, why do you weep? She said to them, because they took away my master and I do not know where they put him. And saying these things, she turned backwards and she saw Yahushua standing and she did not know that it was Yahushua. So she didn't know that the man she was looking at was Yahushua. Why is that? Verse 15, Yahushua said to her, <clears throat> woman, why do you weep? Whom do you seek? Thinking that it was the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you carry him away, tell me where you put him and I will take him away. So she's assuming and thinking because he's in his body is placed in a tomb inside of a garden. And she's assuming that he's a gardener. Scripture doesn't tell us why she doesn't recognize him. Maybe he's in his glorified body. Maybe he's, I'm, I'm not sure. But she doesn't recognize who's in front of her. And she's assuming that he was the gardener. Okay. Look now, pay attention to verse 16. Pay attention to verse 16. Yahushua said to her, Miriam, turning around, she said to him, Rabboni, that is to say, my great one. She now, when she first saw him, he didn't say anything. She didn't know who he was. She didn't realize who she was looking at. But when he called her name, hallelujah, when he called her name, she turned around when she heard his voice and she knew that this was her master. We're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna go into this in a moment. Yahushua said to her, do not touch me for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascended to my father and your father and my Yah and your Yah. Mary and Magdalene came bringing word to the disciples that she had seen the master and that he told her all these things. So he revealed himself first to a woman. He revealed himself first to Miriam and she went to the, bring the good news to the rest of the disciples that she had seen and the resurrections that she had, that he had resurrected. So she came bearing witness of Yahushua, of his resurrection, okay? Now, what does scripture tell us? John 10 and three says, to him, the doorkeeper opens. He says, and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. His sheep hear his voice. My sheep know my voice and a stranger they won't follow. His sheep, it says, hear his voice. He calls his own sheep out by name. Look again at verse 16. Yahushua said to her, Miriam, he called her by name. And it was at that very moment that she realized who she was speaking with. She didn't recognize him. 
Remember, in the beginning was a word and the word was with Yah and the word was Yah. It says when he came in that the world did not know him. They didn't recognize him. Look at this. This, this was just so awesome when, when the Ruach pointed this out. What did he say? When it comes to this good news, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Yah. She was the first one to go back and to witness the resurrection of Yahusha. Faith comes by hearing. When you are sharing the word of Yah, you are planting. When Yahusha came to this earth, what Yah revealed to me with the word, what he revealed is that he was planting. When he came here, he is the word. He was planting seeds. That was part of why he came. He was planting seeds. The good news. What is the scripture says? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Yah. How many, I, 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 I was just like, wow. I was like, wow. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Yah. So when it comes by hearing, hearing the word of Yah, it means it comes by hearing a messenger. How can you hear unless he says that you have a preacher? Unless someone preaches, how can you hear? That's what, when, when you read Romans 10 and 14, the apostle Shaul, the apostle Paul said, how can they call or believe in him on whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? A preacher is a messenger, not just a preacher or overseer, but a messenger, someone who is planting seeds. Every time you are witnessing to someone, every time you're sharing the truth with someone, every time you're sharing the good news, you are, and then I'm talking about the good news of you, who should, you are, you are, you are planning. How he says faith comes by hearing, though, and hearing, he says, comes by the word of Yah. He was referring to the message about Yahusha. How can you call? or believe on him on whom you have not heard. There are many people who have not heard the good news of Yahusha. How can they hear on whom they haven't heard? How can they hear without a messenger? Are you planting seeds? Are you planting seeds? Miriam didn't recognize him. She foretook or for, foretook Yahusha as a gardener or a caretaker. But when he called her name, it says that his sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name. He called her Miriam. And she knew Yahusha is the true gardener. He is the true gardener that will lead his people back to Eden. That's why he says that when you read Psalms 23, he leads you by the path of, he leads you to the path of righteousness for his name's sake. He is the one that is going to lead us back to Eden. He is replanting the righteous seed back in the earth. He is, he is the one who offers salvation to all who would choose to bear fruit. It's a choice to bear fruit. You have to desire to partake in Yah's goodness and to be restored back to the kingdom. That's why he came. He is the true gardener to plant seed so that we might have the right. He came to offer salvation, replanting what the enemy did. Genesis chapter one, verses 11 and 12. And Yah said, cause I want to talk now about why we were created and what does this have to do with planning? When you read Genesis chapter one, verses 11 and 12, it reads, Yah said, let the earth sprout tender sprouts, herb yielding seed and fruit tree bearing fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth bore tender sprouts, the herb seeding seed according to its kind and the fruit tree producing fruit according to its kind, whichever seed is in it. And Yah saw that it was good. So when you read, 
in Genesis, in the beginning, it tells us that we were created in his image and after his likeness. We were created, man, we were created in his image and after his likeness. We were supposed to be like him. He wants righteous seed. When you think about who Yah is, merciful, gracious, loving kindness, forbearing, forgiving, great in goodness and true. When you think about the fruits of the spirit, he wants fruit that's just like him because the fruit represents his character and who he is, the very essence of who he is. He wants righteous seed that is in the earth that is gonna look like him, that is gonna sound like him. He told Yasharel, I planted this vineyard. He said, I cultivated it. I moved the rocks out of the way so that there wouldn't be any hindrance. He said, I did everything. I put a watchtower there. He said, and all I got was rotten grapes. What is this? I said, all of this work that I've done and I got nothing but rotten grapes. Yah wants children that looks like him. Seed that look like him. He is against mixing seed, mixing the, 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 the plants. They're doing all kinds of stuff right now, mixing all kinds of seeds, mixing fruits, talking about some grapple, grapes and apple and all of this stuff. Don't drink any of that stuff. But when we are planning seeds, the word of Yah. There's only one righteous seed. And when we're planning it, we're planning the word. We're not planning our word because Yahushua is the word and we follow him. When we are planting seed, when we are planting the word of Yah, we are sowing. We are sharing the word of Yah. We are planting seeds. When we're, when, we're, when, we're, when we're sharing the word of Yah, we're planting seeds that we pray and hope are planted on good soil. When you talk about the, the, the parable of the seed sower and the ground it falls on. When we're, when we're sharing the good news, of Yusha, when we're sharing the word of Yah, our hope is that it lands on good soil so that the plants, the seeds that we have planted will be watered by others. And then it'll be Yah who will give the increase because we want this, this seed to grow and to be fruitful, which comes by way of Yah. Planting seeds and Seeds being sown. What we're doing is we are literally taking part in planting seeds that we pray that will become righteous and will become fruitful, that will not be defiled or uprooted, that won't fall on stony ground, that can be choked out. The enemy is he who seeks to uproot the good seed from the earth. He is about mixing the seed so that it can be perverted and defiled. When we talk, when we, we when Yahushua had the parable, the man said, okay, well, he sold good seed, but then he said, well, what are these tares doing here? If you sold goods, what are these tares? He said, well, the enemy, while you was asleep, the enemy came in and sold these things. Sometimes you will not recognize a tear. There are many people, wolves and sheep clothing that are growing up together in the church, in the assemblies, and they look like they're righteous. They're Shalom and they're Canaan. They're, they, you know, they're at the, the assemblies and they're keeping feasts and they're looking and reading the Bibles and they seem like they're learned, but they're tares. They're, they're, they're trees with no fruit. That's why it says, by their fruit, you shall know them. You know a tree by their fruit. That's why he likens, he, people are likened to trees. You will know a tree 
by their fruit, just by the things that they're doing. So to sow is Zion, Resh, um, Ion, okay? So to sow, it says the sowing of seeds by scattering them across the field. To spread seeds on the ground, to yield, to bear and to conceive. So when you are sowing, you are literally spreading seeds on the ground. Remember when Yusha said, I'll show you how to become a fisherman of men and spread, throwing the net across the, the, the sea? Let me read a couple of precepts that came to mind when, when um, I learned of this definition. Mark 16 and 15 reads, and Yahushua said to them, go ye into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. So there's a difference between, because people get this and they think that the church has replaced Yasharel and this is not true. Okay, all have the right to salvation, but he is going to remarry and, re and his covenant people. Okay, but there's a, there's two different commissions going on. Okay, the first commission and the great commission. What you're looking at here, Mark 16 to 15, is the great commission to go into all of the world. But the first commission is in Matthew 10 verses five through six where it says, these 12, Yahushua sent forth and commanded them saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans. Do not go there, but rather go where? To the lost sheep of the house of Yashorel. We were commanded, they were commanded. The disciples that were with him, they were from the, the Southern kingdom, Yehuda. They were Yehudites from the Southern kingdom. kingdom. Benjamin. Levi and Judah, okay? All of the disciples, look up to see from the tribe they are. Apostle Shaul, Paul, I believe he said he was from the tribe of Benjamin. That's from the Southern kingdom, from the house of Judah, okay? And that's some of the tribe, the house, okay? It's Benjamin, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, okay? These 12 sent forth and he commanded those 12 he said, go not into the way of the Gentiles. So his first commission is we have to, we are the leaders. Judah is the leading tribe, the house of Judah. It's first given to us, first. Just as judgment starts first with the house, given to us first, but then after we get it, then you go. But the first commission was to Rasharel and then the great commission is everyone else. So I wanted to clear that up. Because that had to be understood because people teach in the church that he's replaced his people. And it's like, no, we're, I'm going to end with some restoration scriptural scriptures. And I didn't know how many times he had compared a garden to his people. Okay. I, I did not know that. So we're going to go into these uh, scriptures and then we're going to end this. I'm going to call my sis in. So there, this one that I'm going to read, there's a part one and part two of Yahushua's missions to restore all things. So Isaiah 61, verses one through three and verses 11. So part one is uh, of Yahushua's mission to restore all things was verses one and part of part, and part of verse two. Isaiah 61, verses one and two. In the spirit of Almighty Yah, is on me because Yah has anointed me to preach the good news to the meat. So this was part of him planting seeds as the master gardener, as the true gardener. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind and complete opening to the bound ones and to proclaim the acceptable year of Yah. Now is part two, okay? Because the, the first work was done when he came in the flesh. This second one will come back when he comes back as judge, okay? And on the day of vengeance of our Yah, to comfort all who mourn, to appoint those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, 
the mantle of praise instead of the spirit of infirmity so that they will be called trees of righteousness, the planting of Yah, that he may be glorified. For as the earth comes out of her buds and as a garden causes that which is sown to grow, so almighty Yah will make righteousness and praise to grow before all nations. Isaiah chapter one, verses 26 through 31. And I will return your judges as at first and your advisors as at the beginning. Then you shall be called the city of righteousness, a faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed with justice and her righteous and her returning ones with righteousness and the ruin of the transgressors and of the sinners shall be together and those who forsake Yah shall be consumed. For they shall be ashamed of the trees which you lusted after, and you shall be ashamed of the gardens that you have chosen. Yasharel, when we return back, we're going to be ashamed of the trees that we lusted after and after the gardens that we have chosen. For you shall be like a tree whose leaves fade and like a garden that has no water in it. And the strong shall be foretold and his work for a spark. And they shall both they shall burn both together, and no one shall quench them. Isaiah 51, 3 through 5. For Yah comforts Zion, he comforts all her desolations, and makes her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of Yah. Joy and gladness shall be found in her. Thanksgiving and the voice of singing. Hallelujah. <laughs> As I'm, as I'm, as when y'all brought me to these precepts, I just, just rejoice because this is the same Psalm 67 and 40. Be glad and rejoice. Okay. <laughs> Be glad and sing for joy. For Yah shall judge the people uprightly and govern the people on earth. Selah. Hallelujah. He says he will make her wilderness like Eden and her deserts like the garden of Yah. Joy and gladness shall be found in it. Thanksgiving and the voice of singing praise. Hear me, my people. Yea, give ear to me, my nation. For the Torah shall go out of me and my justice. I will make rest as light to people. My righteousness is near. My salvation, Yahushua, went out. And my arm shall judge peoples. Coastlands shall wait on me and they shall hope on my arm. So I have Yahushua in, in, in parentheses because... His salvation, Yahushua means salvation, the salvation of Yah and Yah saves. That's what his name means. And he is the arm, okay, the yod of Yah. <clears throat> Jeremiah 31, 10 through 12. Hear the word of Yah, O nations, and declare in the coastlands far away and say, he who scattered Yashrael will gather him and keep him as a shepherd his flock. For Yah has redeemed Jacob and redeemed him from the hand of the one that's stronger than him. Hallelujah. And they shall come and sing <clears throat> in the height of Zion and be radiant over the goodness of Yah for grain and for wine and for oil and for the sons of the flock and the herd. And their life shall be as a water garden and they shall not continue to languish anymore. Hallelujah. They shall come and sing. <clears throat> Ezekiel 33, verse 33 through 36. So says Almighty Yah, in the day I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited and the way shall be built and the desolated land shall be cultivated rather than being a ruin in the eyes of all passing by. And they shall say, this land that was desolated has become like the garden of Eden. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And they shall say this land that was desolated has become, when he restores us back to Eden, this land is going to be become like the Garden of Eden. And the wasted and the desolated and the raised cities are fortified and inhabited. And the nations left all around you shall know that I, Yah, built the raised places and planted. Hallelujah that which was desolated. I, Yah, have spoken it. And he says, Yasharel, that he is going to do it. This is the last scripture. Also, I will restore the captivity of my people, Yasharel, and they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will also plant vineyards and drink their wine and make gardens 
and eat um, their fruit. He says, I will plant them in their own land. They will never again be uprooted from the land I have given them, says Yah, your almighty. So before I bring my sis in, Yah is going to take us back. We are going to return. Everything is going to go back. We are going to return to Edom. Everything is going to go back to the way that it was in the beginning. Yahusha, he is the true gardener, the master gardener who came as Yah's salvation to plant and to sow seeds that will yield and bear righteous fruit. Yah sent Adam and Eve out of the garden so that they wouldn't be eternally destroyed. Okay, remember, through one man, Adam, sin passed on to all men. So as I stated early, earlier, sin is contagious. It contaminates us. So if Adam and Eve would have taken from the tree of life after being contaminated, after being tainted by the tree of knowledge and good and evil, man would have lived forever in that state. Remember, a plant means innocent. It means to be continually in a state of innocent. That is where Yah seeks and desires for his people to be, that we're striving for righteousness, that we're striving to continually be in a state of innocence so it does not hinder and detach and separate us. Because remember, sin separates us from us, uh, from Yah. We, were, we would have been eternally separated from Yah without hope, without ever being able to enter into his presence because that's what sin does. Yah was not going to allow the bad seed, the defiled seed of sin to sprout forever and to flourish and to begin to invade forever. He was not going to allow that. And so that is the message that I have today. Sis, you can come on in. Hallelujah. Oh, wow. I am in <laughs> awe of this lesson. <laughs> I'm telling you, guys, I'm telling you, um, just you, when you just talked about, you know, just Adam and, and Eve, like just starting from the beginning, and, you know, just giving us that reference that right. um, they lived a life of innocence and, and, and not of guilt and, you know, and of sin until they partake and taken from that, the tree of knowledge and good and evil right. and not sin mixed in. And when you did, I, I know I'm jumping, but I want to jump a little bit when you did, because, you know, when y'all tossed them out of the garden yes how you talked about the swirling flames and that yes. definition oh yes. my goodness like just <laughs> but he was protecting them yes and and protecting not only him but the generations to come yes yes so that we wouldn't be eternally <laughs> in that state and never yes be, we would have been destroyed Absolutely, because we know that, you know, the wages of sin is death. Death, yes. Hallelujah. Yes. You know, and I was reading Proverbs 28 and five. When I was reading Proverbs 28 the other day, I had to write the scripture down. And I don't know why I wrote it down, but now I know why. <laughs> it says, evil men, evil men do not understand justice. Mm. But those who seek Yah fully comprehend yes evil men do not understand justice they don't but those who see yah fully comprehends and i'm telling you yah is truly trying to get us to those that are his those are righteous to comprehend that right you know you have to stay in this in this state of of of, of righteousness yes and you do. and this is perfectly i mean the garden I was just in awe of just the definition of eating, yes, pleasure, yes, yes, and and then when you did planter and plant, you know, I'm I'm just telling you, I was just um and just revisiting garden, you know, uh, protection and clothes and plant, just innocent. I I didn't even know plant mean innocent, mm -hmm. you know, like as in a, a state of, as an infant. Continual state of innocence. Yes. No shame, guiltless. No shame. Right. Hallelujah. And then, <laughs> yes. And then planter, 
you know, is when you, you know, that you secure your, your joints. The together. fasten means the fasten. And that's the yes. whole thing. He is the planter, the gardener. That's what, I mean, wow. How can you, I, I mean, was just in all this whole lesson and just how you talk, you know, you revisit, you know, who Yahushua was as the word. And then when you got to, you know, the, the, the prophecy, you know, right. uh, uh, and, and what happened in, in Gethsemane, you know what I'm right. saying? I was just in awe of just, I'm telling you, I was just in awe of, of just all of that because, you know, you can really see why y'all had to expel them from the garden. God, yes. Because. Yes. It, yes. Seeing contaminate. Yes. And, yes. And, and, and he was protecting his people, the love that he had for his chosen people, he was protecting them because he knew that if mm -hmm. Adam and Eve took from that, that tree, that like you said, he, it was oh nothing else he can do for us because he is righteous and holy. And he's not going to uh, um, just accept us in a state of sin, you mm -hmm. know? No. And he so wasn't gonna I, let the enemy win. I mean, no. I just had a different understanding of yes. the garden and just the whole, yes. just the whole thing, just period of garden and planting. I mean, it's yes. just like God's continuing to, this lesson brought me into intimacy with Yah. Yeah. It did. I, I felt intimate with Yah with this. It's just like all of these lessons that he's been giving me, it's all coming together. Yeah. One upon another building with previous knowledge that's how you know it's rock led and so absolutely we want to just thank you for the we you know i hope it is late evening message yes i just want to make away. mention before you close it out gethsemane i was in awe of just knowing yes. that it meant olive oil press like yes. you know and that it was actually a garden but you know near you jerusalem so i was just in awe of Yes, whole, yes, that's yes. why he went there and the pressing mm -hmm. and uh, the yes. grief that he was in. And like yes. I said, knowing that he went three times because he did not hear. And sometimes that may be the case. That just gave Absolutely. me a whole new perspective yeah. when things, when you, he allows you to go through things and it's uncomfortable. And that's what happens. But that olive oil, once it's pressed, you got that glimmering, shiny yes. oil Absolutely. that comes forth. And it's like the joy is on the other side of the pressing. Yeah, and that's what I want to leave you with. Mm -hmm. You know, make sure that you're planting seeds, and it is right to see that you're planting the word of Yah. And you, and apart from you, who should you can do nothing because He can do nothing apart from His Father. Yeah, and so we want to just leave you. Uh, may Yah bless and keep you. May He make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May He lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace in Yahushua's name. So be it. enjoy the rest of your Sabbath. Shalom. Shalom.